For Session Update, I'm Shannon Lurkey. Senate Republicans met with the media to discuss the agreement on the Minnesota Premium Security Act, which provides reinsurance to the state's health care insurance providers. They also reviewed the state government finance bill and the environment and natural resources bill to be debated by the Senate. Here's that press conference. Well, good afternoon. Uh, we wanted to make ourselves available to the press. Uh, I'm here to take some general questions, and then we've got Senator Kiffmeyer and Senator Dames to talk about a few of the issues. Uh, first of all, I wanted to hit the reinsurance uh, conference committee. The Senator Dames will talk about that in detail, uh, but uh, we, we got it done. We wanted to get it done by the end of uh, March and uh, signed into the governor, and that happened. And I want to say that uh, the House, Senate, and governor worked hard to make that happen. Uh, we all came to the table. It was difficult because we couldn't get all the information we needed from the feds on a timely basis, uh, but we worked hard and worked together. Uh, the governor did put out a letter uh, offering some concerns, and we are aware of those. We've been aware of those from the beginning, uh, but I will say that everybody was part of this. Everybody worked hard to, to get a bill that, in the end, my hope is that he will sign. So. Uh, with that, I want to give uh, uh, Senator Dames credit and his whole committee. Uh, I think he's going to give you a breakdown of the bill, and then we'll go from there. Well, thank you, Senator Gazelka. And uh, fortunately, we did get the uh, conference committee wrapped up today, and we did get the bill passed out of conference committee. It'll be known as the Minnesota Premium Security Act. And uh, we, it, as you probably are aware of, we had uh, three different conference committees on this subject, and we would go into recess, and a lot of this uh, reason for that is because we were trying to coordinate the information coming from the federal government, uh, some things that they had we needed to deal with, and coordinate that with the House, the Senate, and the governor's office. And so that was the reason we did take some of our recesses. Uh, they uh, turned out to be very good recesses because we were able to... Uh, come together with some agreements on, on how the contingencies and things like that were going to work. So to give you an idea how the bill is going to function, Minnesota's Premium Security Act uh, will have a board of directors that will be made up of 13 uh, different people. Some will be appointed by the governor, some will come from the industry, some will come as participants of the plans. Uh, it's a reinsurance program and the uh, attachment point will be 50000 the co-insurance will be 80,000 from the 50,000 attachment point to the cap of 250,000, meaning that uh, once uh, the plans have paid $50,000 on a particular individual, the uh, reinsurance would kick in and then the reinsurance would pay 80% of the 250,000, then the insurance plans would take back over after that. Uh, we do also have uh, uh, an accounting and an auditing, auditing procedures are put in place uh, for the board so that they have things to follow. The commissioner has some things that they do also in this plan. Uh, when the folks file their rate structures, they'll be filing what their rate will be for 2018, but also to give us some idea how well it's working, they will also file what it would have been in 2018 without the reinsurance plan. So in a nutshell, that's kind of how the reinsurance plan will work. It'll be effective for 2018, and in 2018, like I said, we'll be using the attachment point process. We also have a working group uh, laid out in this plan so that uh, once we get 2018 in process, this working group will go to work and start taking a look at what other options there might be. Uh, there is a plan out there called the Alaska plan. The Alaska plan has attachment points instead of a dollar figure it, it's on the certain type of diseases and things like that. It's a little more complicated. Uh, we did choose to go with the attachment point system that we're using in order to uh, get this thing th moved through the process. We feel the results will be about the same, but that's something the work group, working group will take a look at, and that group will be looking at how well this is functioning and what type of tweaks mean we may need, need to make for 2019. So with that said, I'll open it up for any questions. Uh, either for you or, and or for the majority leader. Um, the governor gave you this letter today with some problems he has with the bills. And I, I, I know a bill, I know you were aware, with, aware of it. But one of the key things is that uh, he wants some assurances from the uh, health plans that premiums will go down, that the, they'll stay in the market. Uh, and he indicated earlier that he would not 
sign the bill unless they responded to his his letter, his earlier letter and said they ha they haven't. So does that concern you? Uh, we did we did ask the plans if they wanted to speak to this today, and uh, an individual did come up and speak on behalf of plans, and they're very interested in this process. We got to keep in mind until they know the bill is going to pass and know all the particulars in the bill, it's pretty hard for them to commit to be able to do things until they can actually actuarially take a look now that this plant, this has gotten this far. Now they can really take a close look at where they're going to be. I do believe that we're going to have some good participation by the plans. Uh, Paul, I know that you visited with them for a few minutes, so if you would like to maybe make a comment on that. Yeah, a couple of things. Uh, I met with the plans early on as we were moving through this process, and uh, they did put out a letter. It was more general. Uh, and all of the plans signed it, you know, with their, that, that reinsurance really gives them the certainty that they need in the market. They don't know even what the loss ratios are from, from the plan from this year, who signed up and, and who's in there and how much money they're making or losing. They can say with, with certainty that the premiums will be uh, lower than they, what they would have been without the reinsurance. In fact, when we set up the premium or, or how much money we were going to put into it, we asked Commerce, a pro give us the best estimate of what it would cost to buy down premiums 20%. And that's, you know, so they figured a number, that's the 271 million that we're putting into the plan. But the plans also don't know what other reforms we're gonna pass yet this year. Each one of those has a potential cost. And that's why they have a hard time guaranteeing it. Uh, uh, at least two of the plans uh, indicated to me that they intend to be virtually in every county. Uh, there, what the, the challenge is, if you have a county in a, a rural area where they might only have one provider, well, whose network will they be in? How do you work out uh, the situation where they would be in two networks? Those are some of the, the unique challenges we're trying to figure out, but they are definitely committed to being in Minnesota. They just are, it's, it's a little more difficult to guarantee and write in exactly what's gonna happen, and that's why there's some hesitation from the plans. That they will that they will give a response to the governor after they've had in fairly short order after they've had a chance to digest this bill that was uh, approved by the conference today. My hope is that they will. I know at least one of them was going to call the governor. I think even today to set up a time to personally meet. So I, I'm hoping that is happening. Um, we're all kind of uh, walking through murky waters with this. We don't know what the feds are going to do. They don't know what the rates, uh, what the loss ratios are right now. All we know is by doing reinsurance, we guarantee some certainty so that the plans uh, can come operate, and we're hoping uh, more plans come into the market as a result. Any other questions? Uh, when, when's it, are you going to take it up tomorrow? Uh, the House will take it up tomorrow, and then after the House takes it up, we'll take it up sometime tomorrow evening. This is my understanding. Okay, thank you. Other questions? Well, thank you, folks. So, Senator Kipmeyer is here to answer any questions about the state government uh, budget that's mm -hmm. moving forward. Thank you very much. So, the state government uh, omnibus bill will be on the floor in just a little while here. So, just making myself available, give you a quick snapshot, if you like, of the bill. I think that would be helpful. And just remember, our, our theme, every committee, when you do your work, uh, was to uh, increase transparency, accountability, and efficiency. That was really important. The other thing is priorities. Everybody's got to have priorities. We all do in our family budget, and so we um, should have them in the state budget as well. So the cost curve was just going up, and we just felt that it was time to bend that cost curve down and, uh, and then reprioritize. So we did increase funding, though. It's part of that uh, for cybersecurity. That is an emerging field that was very important. And it's emerging, just like uh, other things that come in that we're going to need to do more. Uh, but we put a, a good uh, amount of money into the cybersecurity area, $14.6 million. We also uh, recognize the Amber Alert system needs some equipment upgrades. We felt to Minnesotans all over the state of Minnesota, upgrading that equipment is very, very important. And then also uh, we were able to do some election equipment uh, grants, uh, regards that will benefit all of Minnesota as well. Just have to remember that since 2011, there weren't any budget cuts. And there was always the promise of technology is going to make us more efficient and, and more productive. Uh, but in fact, what we've seen, though, is that budget steadily went up. 
Thousands more of employees were added uh, to the state government. Matter of fact, in the governor's uh, proposal, he said there's about 2,400 additional employees. And so all of those have significant costs that go with them, and uh, technology should deliver on what was promised to us. I have to remember that Minnesotans, their budgets haven't grown, their paychecks haven't grown, and um, they've had to reprioritize, they've had to cut back and redo things. So I think government should do exactly the same. I think that's an important theme that we put through. So that just gives you a little bit of idea of that theme as well as some of the specifics. Any questions? Just an idea of how, uh, how much election equipment will be replaced with money you'd provide? It's a matching grant for the uh, poll books. It's a 75-25 match. And for the other equipment, uh, tabulating, and for assistive voting technology, it's a 50-50 match. Uh, right now out there, the greatest need is for the poll books. Uh, they're still using paper. It's time for them to move on uh, to a modern era. Uh, we'll help our election judges. We'll help get information faster. And then the tabulating equipment we've had for a long time. Uh, it's great, solid precinct uh, tabulation equipment. It's a real workhorse, lasts a long time. So by those two things, and the governor had recommended uh, $3.5 in each year, both with the omnibus election bill and with this one, uh, we're about $6.4 million. And for the poll books and the assisted voting, will that mean everybody who doesn't have fairly new equipment will be able to get it, or how much of the state? It's a competitive grant account, so it will be a matter of local decisions. Uh, they have to put some of their money in as well, which I think is really important, that they, they have a portion of their money as well. Uh, we incentivize them because, uh, for many of them, the e-poll books are something new. And we've always done that. We've incentivized them with a little bit more money, whereas they already had the precinct optical scan already. Uh, but this will be local decisions. They'll get to decide uh, what's the greatest need for them, and um, then they can apply for these grants. The governor had cautioned the legislature, both the House and the Senate, not to do across the board cuts. Mm -hmm. Does this steer clear? Does this bill steer clear of that warning? I believe we did. I believe we took a very thoughtful approach. Uh, some of them had a 7.5% reduction in uh, operation area, and others uh, had a 4 to 5%. Uh, some of them that are in my budget, such as the advisory councils, uh, the ethnic councils, minority councils, are uh, funded at the forecast-based funding, so they didn't get an increase nor a decrease. I think that we took a thoughtful approach to every one of these areas. We also um, took some specific opportunities um, in areas such as uh, the Department of Revenue. That was where we did the 4 to 5 percent for them to recognize uh, the work that they do largely touches Minnesotans. We also gave them the authority to transfer money within their budget uh, to meet the priority of taxpayers uh, who are filing their income taxes. So that flexibility was very important for them. The cuts you're talking about, is that off base or is that from current spending? That is off the uh, forecasted base. The governor wanted an increase of 16% off of that amount, off of the previous 16-17 year budget, uh, a 15% increase. And from the forecast to base, he wanted a, an additional 13.6% and many hundreds more, just in this bill alone, of additional employees. What's the impact on the budget of the legislature? Did you take a 7.5 or Flat. Five? Kept them flat. So why didn't you cut the legislature if you're cutting well, other One of the things with operating? input is that we have some, uh, a large um, number of computer systems that need replacing. And so a large portion of that is going to have to go to upgrade our own computer systems. So you heard the same from the department saying that they have computer needs as well and, and online needs, and yet there's cuts to their operating. And their base funding, they already have money for technology. That is a part of their base funding. It's ongoing uh, base funding that they already have that. And the salary increases are not in this bill, correct? Salary increases are not. All right. Well, thank you very much. Appreciate your time. Oh, Senator sure. <laughs> So, Senator Engerbritz and the Environment Committee are uh, coming from somewhere. Where is this? <laughs> this is something. Oh, it goes up, huh? Okay. <laughs> New stuff. Well, thank you so much for, for having me. I was just kind of on the fly here, uh, bouncing between here and the Finance Committee, and I think they're just about to call us back. So, anyhow, the uh, 
Environment and Natural Resources uh, uh, Policy and Budget Committee is coming together tonight on the floor. We've got a, uh, a lot of, I think, uh, good legislation there dealing with uh, the PCA permitting process. Uh, we're also looking at, uh, and specifically there, actually moving uh, 1,000 animal units that is in, in law now to 2,000 animal units uh, before they has to, has to have an EIS permit. Um, that's something that was in 1999, and uh, even today, uh, one should you just need to know that the, uh, the sensitive areas of the state of Minnesota would not qualify. In other words, you'd have to have a permit even at eight, even at the numbers of 500. So I know there's been some angst over that, but it's still uh, it's something that uh, we certainly need to move forward with. Game and fish bill, uh, not a whole lot there. Uh, we do have a, a, a scopes on muzzle loaders. Uh, bill that uh, that I've been uh, kind of uh, uh, initiating over the years. We think it's time to move into that. We're one of the few states in the Midwest that doesn't have that totally uh, from uh, for any age. Uh, we had a, a 60 and over a couple of years ago. Um, uh, not, uh, uh, two lines fishing uh, might be of interest. That certainly has created some interest. Uh, uh, people have been calling in saying it's about time Minnesota does that. Uh, that was a uh, Senator Gazelka and I actually talked about that, and, and I came up with the, uh, with the idea from some of our constituents as to why not. If you want to have that second line in Minnesota, and if you want to pay for it, it'll cost you $5. And half of those dollars will be designated to the, uh, to the stocking of walleye, the state fish statewide. So uh, we think that's a, a real positive thing. Uh, we're also dealing with, uh, uh, with the uh, most recent uh, settlement from the uh, Volkswagen uh, lawsuit uh, where there's uh, going to be uh, quite a few million dollars. I think it's plus 40 some million coming coming into the state of Minnesota and uh, Senator Bach has got an initiative there. I think it was a, a good bill included in, in this bill that uh, uh, requires the, uh, the folks to come to the legislature before any expending of those dollars. So, And they'll be spent of course on, uh, on air quality and water quality projects uh, throughout the years. So, um, uh, with that, uh, I, I think I'll just open it up for some questions. Buffers. Buffer strips are in there. I'm sorry. That's, that's, cer that's certainly been one of the top top subjects. Senator Westrom's initiative is in there. It, uh, uh, it deals with uh, existing uh, buffer strips. Uh, uh, of course, we're talking about uh, different numbers throughout the state of Minnesota as to what counties are, are already uh, accomplishing that 50-foot buffer. Uh, upwards of, uh, we're hearing 90%. We think that number might be quite high. I'm not sure. Uh, but Senator Westrom brought the initiative forward to actually uh, uh, put that date out a little further so we can do a little more research on it, and uh, so that's in the bill. On the 16, a lot, a lot, apparently a lot of miles will be 16 and a half feet buff, foot buffers instead of 50. Yep. I've seen the figure of 48,000 miles on oh, that. Boy, I, 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 haven't seen, that? I have not seen that figure, uh, Don, I, I really haven't, so... Is this a significant change in your opinion? A lot of uh, areas will need smaller buffers. I think what we're finding out that the 50 doesn't just fit everywhere. I mean, there's not a there's not a need for it. In some areas, they actually have big, you know, wider than 50 foot. You know, the, the vague community is already doing that, and property owners. And, and then you then you throw into the mix, uh, like where I come from in Douglas County, where you have land zone zoning already for lakes and uh, uh, that play into the mix, and and. Uh, so it, it definitely needs some work, and I think that's what Senator Westrom is trying to do, is just to make sure we do it deliberately and, and uh, moving forward. But we certainly know the governor governor's concerned about that. That's one of his top initiatives. And so are you going to do something about that before you send the bill to, to him? Are you going to try to reach Well, we'll see. Compromise? We'll see what happens. Uh, it's, it's, going to be, uh, it's going to be talked about tonight, so I, I would expect there will be some amendments. The buffer implementation. Uh, I believe it's. I believe it's a. Uh, it's a little over a year uh, delay, if I remember right exactly. There's an awful lot, awful lot in my bill that I have some dates. So, but I know that it is somewhat of a delay. And, and then you did mention permitting. Uh, the bill talks about permits, and I, I'm yeah, not Senator, sure how big a deal this is. Uh, well, Senator Newman's got, has a has a bill in there uh, uh, with regards to the MPCA. Uh, Delaying the permitting process uh, in one particular part of uh, the, the PCA's uh, bud, uh, uh, function until there's a report that's actually read. There's a report that has not been gone over yet, so there's a, there's a delay there, and you'll 
Uh, you'll hear Senator, Senator Newman talk quite eloquently about that. He's been working on it a long time. A lot of small cities are, are running up against huge costs, and, and uh, that, of course, has brought a large concern to our caucus about uh, how much these, these uh, city uh, water plants and sewer plants are having to, wastewater plants are having to, uh, to come up with to, to actually meet the standards. So there might be some argument uh, in the future about the standards. Thank you. So, oh, thank you. I, Tim, do you, you ask me a question every day, every week on the floor, and it is... Real ID? Thank you. <laughs> so, we're going to take Real ID up uh, Thursday, if all goes as planned. Uh, I believe we have some language that we will offer that uh, uh, some of the, the, the people on the other side of the aisle will accept, and we'll move it to conference committee and then work with the House to find a solution uh, that we can get out of both the uh, bodies and to the governor. So, what's the you got to wait and see. And is tomorrow one of these split start early and recess and then come back late days? Or? Yes. Time for lunch. Yeah, I'm sorry about that, but we uh, we are we're working hard. We want to make sure that we give everybody a break and that we finish. We hopefully we will finish even a, a day early if we can. That would be great. So. While you're there, give us an idea of the overall philosophy now. Do you plan on sending the bills to the governor the way you and the House agree to, or do you plan to bring the governor in and try to get bills that he can sign after yeah, that? Yeah, what I would say is look at the bills we've already passed, and we've tried to include the governor as much as possible. Uh, the governor has come to the table, uh, or his the representatives, uh, I, that's the trend that I want to continue to foster. Uh, I think we'll get better bills if we uh, work that way. Um, I see no reason why that trend will not continue. So as long as that continues, that's the direction we're going to keep going. So, in other words, once you get to conference, you're going to try to work with the governor's yes. office to create bills rather than send him a batch, have him veto them. And that would be my hope, yes. If, if we send a bill that he vetoes, you know that things are breaking down. But uh, if you look at the, the number of bills we've done already, that there is a success rate and, and a way to do it, and we're going to keep doing that. And you're not concerned he's going to veto reinsurance, given that his concerns continue? Well, we continue to talk, and uh, I guess we'll find out together. But we have had lots of conversations about it. You know, all of us are, have some concerns. Like I said, we don't exactly know uh, what the future is, but we're trying to bring some stability. And he's aware of that, too. He knows that we're, we're doing our best as well. One of the two of you mentioned something about future reforms, this session. Like, was it you, it was Senator? Senator and, and I'm just, this I, I should have asked that earlier, but are we talk, you talking about some significant reforms yet this year? That well, could affect next year? We had the, uh, you know, the Senate file one was the, the, the bill that had the relief and some reform in it. Now, this Senate, the House file here has been the reinsurance, and now there's another bill that has some reforms in it. I'm not sure just what all the reforms are, but it will help uh, tighten the market up a little bit. When I say that, I mean make, make the, the, the dollars go a little further than what they normally do in order to try to make this thing work better. Do they need to, the plans need to know that before the end of this week, like so they did on this? Senator, ben, Senator, Senator Benson's working on another bill that she is in con, uh, conversation with the plans, yes. So they're aware of yeah. Well, no, not the urgency on that. There was no. the reinsurance. No. Okay. All right. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Yeah.